Hi, I'm Colin O'Donoghue, uh, actor. <laughs> Hi, Colin. Thanks a million for, uh, for taking part in, in, in this. Um, Colin um, worked with us here in Axis, Jesus, back in 2007 on uh, Dermot Bulger's Wake in the Road. Um, yeah, a long time ago. And we'll 2007? Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll come, come around to that in a minute. But how I started all these conversations so far, Colin, is kind of asking people, about when they're growing up and was it kind of something that you felt looking back now you feel you were destined to do you know was it kind of in you the arts or in your family or you know was that kind of being an actor something you always wanted to do uh i mean i think uh, something to do with the arts i guess for want of a better uh, term would have always been there i think it would have been if it wasn't acting then uh, like a musician or i mean i watched basically as a gig and musician for 10 years as well, even when I was doing Walking the Road with you guys, you know. Um, so, or, you know, I used to love to paint and draw. I don't do that so much. I don't, I should really, especially now that we're in quarantine. But, uh, you know, it was always going to be something like that. Um, and I, I, I joined the, the youth theatre here in town, the Druid Youth Theatre, and that was sort of the, the first step on the road to, to be becoming an actor. And was it kind of when you joined that, was it out of out of, you know, an instinct or out of kind of I'm not sure what, what the hell did this is or was it something that you were kind of brought towards? No, it was uh, I had some friends to be honest, um and I was meeting them for a coffee. And um they were doing a play and I was meeting them at rehearsals uh, and they needed somebody to read in, somebody hadn't shown up and I was like, No, no way. <laughs> uh, but they convinced me to do it and um, uh, they ended up offering me the part and I kind of said yeah why not you know I wasn't doing anything else on a Saturday afternoon so and was uh, you playing music before that like was kind of music in your life at that stage I mean I'd be yeah I'd be, I'd be playing the, the guitar since I was 10 or 11 so I mean I wasn't in a band or anything at the time but I was I'd sit at home and I'd play Led Zeppelin's The Rain song on the guitar for like three hours, you know, just, or, or Hendrix or something like that, just, you know, just for constantly playing the chords over and over and over and over in my room and uh, thinking, uh, picturing being in front of 100,000 people, I suppose. <laughs> and as, did you find that kind of, that imagination of wanting to stand, you know, on, on those stages, that that kind of, when you went into the youth theatre, was it kind of like, was it something similar for you? Was there kind of a, that buzz? I mean, I was I was only ever playing, like, the guitar and stuff, really, for myself as a release. It was never a, it was never as a sort of exhibitionist kind of thing. I didn't, I didn't necessarily want, I, I wasn't doing it thinking, right, well, my plan is to, to be world famous yeah. guitarist and you know all that kind of stuff it was it was never anything like that and but to be honest with you with the with the acting when I joined the youth theater it, it, it I realized that I was quite shy as a kid and and stuff like that and, and it meant that I was able to pretend to be someone else and I liked the feeling of the freedom that that gave yeah and what what age were were you when you when you joined the the youth theater club uh, fifteen or sixteen, I think it was. But, yeah. And were you there for for a few a, a few years doing it? Yeah, I was there for. Or maybe I was a bit younger. Actually, maybe it was. I was definitely fifteen. I was doing fifteen because I was in the theatre for a few years, for you know, or certainly up to seventeen or whatever. And, were, and did you get opportunities to like, obviously what sort of performances were you in, involved in around those times? Well, I, you know, I was lucky. To, I mean, I think the the main thing that sort of really uh, brought it home to me that it's something that I loved was um, when I was sixteen. We did the I don't know if they still do it for the theatres the BT Connections the British uh, the BT Connections competition and we did a show called Eclipse. And for the, for people who don't know, um, there would be plays, one act plays written by quite famous playwrights or poets or literary people, you know, like uh, Simon Armitage, who wrote Eclipse, was the, I think he was the millennium poet, do you know what I mean, in the UK. And they would send the same script to maybe, I don't know, what, you'd know better than me, probably 10 different yeah. 
youth, youth theatres throughout Ireland and, and the UK. And then they would ultimately pick what they felt was the best one uh, to go perform it then in the National Theatre in London. Yeah. And so we we won we won for for Eclipse, and we we got to perform it on the Olivier uh, stage, which is small beginnings. You know, <laughs> small beginnings. Yeah, it doesn't really get much uh, much bigger than the Olivier, to be honest. And uh, we got a standing ovation. It, and interestingly, it was directed by Darren Thornton, who since gone on to direct uh, you know huge things and stuff. Yeah. And um, I'd still be in touch with Darren quite a bit. And, you know, um, it was just a, a magical sort of experience, but it was, the, I played a glue sniffer um, and, you know, I was quite an, uh, quite a, an innocent um, teenager, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I didn't drink or anything like that. And it was wild because I was playing this crazy, crazy kid who just was high on glue the whole time. And, you know, we got a standing ovation from a packed out, audience in the Olivier and we got an award from Anthony Miguel and all that kind of stuff. It was just, and wow. I sort of went, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and was there not, do you remember getting that feeling of kind of going, okay, this yeah. is, yeah. I remember when we got the standing ovation, I remember that was sort of like, you know, we didn't expect that. We expected people to clap because of it, what it was, but it was really, really good. It was really good. And, um, and of a really high standard, I would think, for youth theatre. Uh, and it was just an amazing feel because people genuinely were, were were really into it. You know, you, you know the way when you're on stage, you can tell. Yeah. You can tell when an audience is with you and when they're not. And it's not just quietness. There's more to it. There's a, you can almost hear people listening. It's, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Exactly what you mean, yeah. It's like, you know that you have them in the palm of your hand and that's what it felt like. And I was like, Oh my God, this is, you know, because we, as like, even like 15, 16, 17 year olds who were in the play, we were in the world. We weren't on stage. We were in the, and that's a sign that you know that you're on a, you're doing, you're doing something right is when you're in the world, you yeah. forget that you're doing a play because then you're creating something else for, for an audience there, you know? Yeah, it's gas. You can you can hear it when you, when you talk about it. You can hear how vivid that experience and the memory yeah. of it kind of it still is. And it, it must have been such a because you know you mentioned Darren. There. I mean, that was a really kind of exciting time around Drahad as well. There was a lot going mm. on, uh, trade and and Calippo and and you you went you worked with Darren like, again, didn't you? You worked with with Calippo. Well, I used to yeah, I used to be a company member of Calippo Theatre Company that yeah. Darren uh, set up and you know just and you're right and actually interestingly the the first play the, the one that I got drafted into that my friends were doing uh was a, a short one act play that had been written by Yasmin Akram who's gone on to uh do stuff and you know yeah like there was Darren there was Colin his brother who's you know a huge writer and you know and it's funny because we we would have then gotten on you know Darren and Colin went on to do the um National Youth Theatre uh and through that, I would have met like Simone Kirby and and Phil, Philly McMahon and all people like that. And I, in in a weird way, we all kind of you know gravitated towards the same circles, even though we were living in Drada. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so, um, were you were you involved in the International Youth Theatre that that that, that that year? I wasn't involved. No, I wasn't involved. Um, uh, no, that, I think that it was only I want to say it was only Darren and Colin from. The trade youth theatre who were involved that year. When, when you came uh, back from doing the clips, I mean, like you know, as I said, that's some experience to have at such a young age. And like, what did you feel? Something had changed change in you in relation to what you, you know, how how serious you were taking it. But like, you know, I felt I felt really conflicted. I felt really conflicted because my my plan for the whole time was to go to art college to do okay. something with painting or, or fine art or actually the main thing was model making special effects or animation they were the ones so it was always kind of I, I was always fascinated with behind the scenes and in movies and stuff like that and how all that kind of stuff, how people create a world and you know I loved the minute detail that they go into so it was always probably going to fall into something to do with that okay. you know but uh yeah and was, was the art was that kind of interest from very young? Like, was that kind of something you, when you when you were growing up? Were you were you the one who was kind of sitting there drawing? 
Yeah, yeah, listening to me, my mum and dad's old records, listening to the Sergeant Peppers and Rory Gallagher and Led Zeppelin and stuff, and I'd sit at the table and, yeah, just draw nonstop. I think, uh, you know, that's interesting from knowing you kind of back, you know, in when you were up with us in Axis here, that the music was a huge part. I mean, like in the wide range of kind of um, influences are fairly apparent. Like, you know, you're, you're very music literate, you know, seem, seem to be mm. at, at a very young age as well. But that kind of, was there that, you know, good record collections around your house? Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, I, I put a, lot, a huge influence on me was my brother Alan as well. You know, he's he was music was just his passion. You know, music and football, and so I'd listen to a lot of his stuff. But he he had quite a varied taste in music too. But definitely, um, you know, like my parents had all sort of the records that they had. There's a lot of Beatles. There's a lot of you know those Stones. There was you know Rory Gallagher, the Led Zeppelin. It was like a, a, a who's who of the records that you should listen to. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, or certainly for the for the type of music I liked, you know. But um, and then yeah, when, no, was, when you went into the, the youth theatre, was that something there as well? Like was you know I think a lot of people talk about youth theatre and they find people that are interested in similar things and they are themselves. Mm -hmm. that, kind of something that kind of grew for you there as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and it was you kind of it also just really broadened my horizons because I was you know like I said I was quite um quite shy and kept myself to myself you know I, I had my my friends who are still my best friends and you know um but when you meet like a load of different people from different walks of life and stuff like that you know and there were some teenagers there who were worldly wise that seemed like they were like 30, you know what I mean? Or whatever, but they were, and you know, it just, uh, it was great. It was great to meet people who just were willing to yeah. open up and experiment, you know? And their choices then, would you say, were conflicted when kind of it came to leaving school and that side of things, what kind of happened then? You know, what was kind of in your head? Um, well, I was going to go to uh, college and I'd, I'd, I'd been lucky enough to sign with an agent at that stage, an acting agent. Okay. To, um, I'd, I'd gone, I did a corporate video um, when I was about 18 and the casting directors, uh, who are quite big casting directors, um, said that they had me in mind for a couple of things and that I should have an agent. So they set me up with an agent uh, and they didn't really want me to go to college uh, because of whatever these things were that they thought, I, I never know, I never found out what they were. But then I'd, I'd missed the registration for the courses that I wanted to do. And the only course I had left was uh, the Gaelic School of Acting. And now to be honest, I was really torn. Did I want to go there or did I want to go to our college? Did I want to go there? You know what I mean? And so the decision was kind of made for me because they came back and said, actually, you should probably go study something just in case. And so the only, you know, yeah, <laughs> and then um, like but that was that's a big deal having an acting agent that that young as well. I mean, that's you know, that's yeah, yeah. I mean, I was wildly uh, when I look back at it, you know, whatever about the youth theatre and all all the stuff that we do there, but I was wildly inexperienced, you know, really to to sort of even consider, you know, not going to college just to. Just to, I mean, I, I was only just eighteen, and yeah. I was I was a fairly I would have said young eighteen as well. You know, you know what I mean. And uh, I definitely think I benefited from going to college and uh, subsequent years of being out of work. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me and again, kind of you know, people talk about like you know that, that widening of the tribe when you when you arrive into the the acting college or, you know, the college environment in general and also the realisation of, oh, geez, this is work. Um, how did you, did, did that kind of come, did you enjoy that straight, straight off, off the bat, that kind of environment? I, yes and, yes and no. I mean, a college I found really daunting, going to college I found daunting, you know, and I enjoyed the people that I, I was at college with and I enjoyed learning about the craft because, you know, because it's, at the end of the day, it, acting is a craft and, you know, you have to sort of find your own way of, of utilizing the specific skills to make it work and make it believable, you know? Um, 
so all that I benefited from going to college definitely but it was pretty like you know all of a sudden you're in especially drama school because it's not like the entire year are people who've just left school yes. and are like you drama school is completely different because you've got some people like we had one guy uh, Charlie I think was 40 when he started right and then you had people who had already done master's degrees who decided they wanted to become actors and you had, do you know what I mean so you had a whole different gamut of uh, characters and so that's kind of that was a bit like oh wait you know hold on everybody else is starting uh and going off getting drunk with people all their own age you know what i mean yeah yeah i think that but also i suppose in a way that life experience kind of helps further down the line but i didn't have the immediate sense of the shock did you yeah. uh, did you like would you enjoy the aspect of the other training of the craft learning was that something that you kind of took to yeah i, I mean i i enjoyed the i, I enjoyed the art of creating a character if that makes sense I, I, I like you know instead of just relying on saying the, the lines and being emotional i liked learning about how to hone a character and decide oh well his voice is going to be this and he's going to move like this or he might do you know what i mean yeah. and that informs everything to do with with who that character is, you know, and and certainly I, to to go back to walking the road, you know, part of what walking the road was, was like we were playing, Kelly and I were playing. I think between us, there was something like forty characters. Yeah, there was something. It was something like that. It was a huge amount of different characters that we were playing, and so it helps when you're doing something like that where you have to switch in and out of. Yeah, you know, all, all of a sudden I'm an old man or whatever. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden I'm this. Because you have to work on that to make it believable, or else it's not going to work. I think it's I think it's interesting as well. You you know, um, your fascination from me being a young lad around the minutiae of kind of say you know the, the back end of filmmaking or or you know of the special effects and the model. You know, the kind of a technical thing there, kind of that that similarly the way you speak about the mm. there of the, it, the the devil being in the detail in a way. You know that it's kind of it's the small things. Yeah, I mean it's funny because. I would consider myself more of an instinctual actor when I'm on set or when I'm, do you know what I mean? I, I'm, I sort of prefer to take on what you give me and then I'll work with that as opposed to being completely right. Well, this is the line. This is the way that I deliver the line. This is my intention. This is what I'm, you know what I mean? And it has to be that way because that, that stifles any sort of creativity. But weirdly, I think in the lead up to that, that's where the minutia is, is the lead up to creating the character, to understanding who that character is, what he's about, what what his likes, what his wants are, what his hopes and dreams, all that kind of stuff, how he moves, how he talks. And then you forget about it because you've already done the work. Yeah, right. So then I can say the so then I can say the line in his voice because I know I'll get I'll be right. Yeah, yeah. Very good. It's for very but really um so really interesting as well because I think for, in your career, um, certainly in the first kind of 10, 10 years of it, there was a very easy flip between TV, film, and stage. You know what I mean? It was kind of that was, hmm. um, and so the, the next big step is always when people leave college and kind of go, okay, what what now? What, what was the sense for you of kind of coming coming out of that environment? Uh, it was it was sort of. I'm trying to think now. I mean, I think it was pretty scary, you know. Uh, leaving and and then because in you in, in drama school in particular you're in a bubble you know and you, you sort of you know you're only really competing with i know that sounds terrible you're only really competing with people in your class for roles whatever and nothing prepares you for that thing of going into an, an audition where there's 30 lads and it's just like next 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 you know what I mean? Nothing prepares you for that. And nothing prepares you for the phone calls, the constant phone calls, or not saying, no, not interested. No, yeah, no, uh, no, it's going to be you. Yeah, it's a big thing from With, an actor's point of view of, of that waiting, of the, the waiting moment, and having to wait. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with no explanation as well as to, <laughs> as to why, you know what I mean? And then some, sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, I I, I, got, I know that I know that I absolutely nailed that audition. How come it didn't work out? But you never find out. I mean, yeah. sometimes it would simply just be like, they thought you were great. It's just that your hair is brown. Yeah. 
they wanted somebody blonde. And then you go, oh, okay, all right. Well then, at least I did good work. But you never get the feedback. Yeah. So it's just sort of like <laughs> you're constantly beating yourself up. That, that's, I mean, that's a point well, 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 well made. It's a point that maybe kind of the people outside the, the industry won't understand. The point of like, yeah, rejection is, is kind of one thing. But rejection without reason is a whole, is a whole mm-hmm. other kind of bone. Yeah. Um, when you came out then, like, you know, you kind of look at, I'm not sure of, of the kind of sequences to this, but like how, how, how long was it before you kind of started to get your, to get your boots dirty? Uh, well, the first thing, it was, it was a few months. I want to say maybe four or five months. Mm. Uh, my first job was a workshop with, uh, um, with Liam Halligan, uh, on, which subsequently went on to be a show called Leaving. Yeah. Um, with Queerhawks company, um, who are now gone, but uh, it was a show about suicide, and so it was a it was like a week long workshop uh, with the writers and with you know families and counselors and all that kind of stuff, and which was actually fantastic. It was it was the best first job that you could possibly have because you were thrown straight into the deep end of some really heavy stuff, but you were also you didn't have you didn't have the concern of a show at the end of it, what you did was you had all the proprietary work, you had all the stuff and all the, you know, really delving into creating a character and creating a world and stuff like that. And then the playwright was going off to write it. And then yeah. like six or a year later, we, we were doing the play, but so I did that. And then later that year, um, or uh, maybe it was the year, no, it was, it was about, we did the play well, I can't remember exactly the time myself but I did it I did a, a show for RTE called um, Home for Christmas yes um, in 2002 so that'd be about right because I, I would have left summer of 2001 I finished in the Gaiety School yeah. and uh, I did that I played a, an American in this really dark black comedy yeah it's very bad. Um, I remember it well it was, it was really good and it, it kind of it was Quickly, very, very, very well received. Didn't you? Didn't you? Yeah. Didn't you win something for it, wasn't there an award? I won. A, yeah, I won an IFTA for best new talent. Yeah, which is kind of, again, nice to, nice to, you know, nice to get that suit on that early in your career, you know. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've talked about this before and, and other things. It's like you know, I, I won that, and then, you know, I didn't get, I, I didn't get any work for for a while, and it just, you know, and especially after something like that, where you win and you feel. Oh, okay. People, people know that I'm, I'm, I'm okay. You sort of, without the explanation as to why you're not getting something, then you begin to delve even deeper into a whole different world. You're like, well, how, am I, have I jinxed myself? Is this like a, is this like some sort of curse or what, what's going on? You know. Yeah. And around that time again, you, um, I suppose television would kind of go, go, go along that track for, for, for a minute. I mean, you're involved in. You know, a few works that were kind of again breakthrough works for people, and kind of works that kind of were not seminal. You know, were kind of were kind of of the moment. I mean, obviously, back to the Thornsons with Love, Love, Love is the, the, the drug, which was kind of again mm. a really breakout series on RT television at at, at the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I you know, I did the uh, workshops for for that as well, and um, you know, I went on to play uh, Ruth Nega's brother. Um, <laughs> So uh, he was a half brother, and uh, but he was a he was a proper little scumbag, <laughs> which was fun to play. You know what I mean? Like a shaved head, and you get to. Um, but that was really, again, that was. I mean, that I think Love Is a Drug was sort of the. I think it was a defining show for, RTE. You know, I don't look. I'm being sort of you know just kind of waffling on a little bit, but I'm not so sure that shows like. Uh, love, hate, hate and, mm. and like normal people and stuff like that would be here on RT because nothing had been on RT that it was ever like love is the drug. It was so modern, it was so young, and so you know, and visceral and stuff. And you know, I think that it's a it's a testament to Darren. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right because as I said there was you know the year that you came out in in um come out of school and, and draw them or kind of involved in the youth and hit there and then kind of you know that there was a you know a number of years there where there was stuff happening of national importance coming out of, of Drahana and I would fu- I would fully agree with you that love is is the drug and 
the people involved in the the cast and and, and and obviously in the creatives, but also the fact that it was warts and all. Do you know what I mean it wasn't? It was what it was. You know, and I think that mm-hmm. was that hadn't been seen before in in in, in, the, in that no. way. Um, no. Around the same time, then I mean, you were still doing your work. Actually, looking back on your um, theatre CV, CV the, the other day, it was kind of you worked with an, an awful lot of brilliant companies that were re- regionally based. Do you know what I mean? Or you were kind of working mm. with the company that toured you were working from, like companies, excuse me, from Ma- Ma- Manon and obviously from from Brad- 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 and the, and the great storytellers. Mm-hmm. But that must yeah. be great experiences having that wide range of of uh, touring work and work that came from those regions. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was never intentional. I think it was more they were, I think they were more companies that were willing to take a, a sort of a punt on uh, thinking outside of the box with casting and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? It, it certainly, um, I, you know, I did a couple of workshops with the Abbey and stuff like that. And, you know, I would have absolutely loved to have done a show in the Abbey or, or the Gate or whatever, but that that just was never... It, it just wasn't on the cards really for do you know what I mean and um, you know I was lucky then that I got to do some really like you know some theatre that I'm really I don't think there's one play that I if I'm honest and I'm not to my own but I don't think there's one play that I, I could turn around and say oh yeah well I wish I hadn't done that yeah yeah you know, I think I'm really very, very proud of the the work I was lucky enough to to get to do. To be honest, yeah, it's, it, it can kind of say we kind of some of the companies are kind of gone, you know, and some of them are kind of gone. yeah. It, just, it, was, it was also a time in in Ireland pre recession or pre you know pre pre bust when when you are working with island theatre when you are working with you know as I said, Scooby Theatre, Queer Hawks and Mon. There, there was a kind of mm. sense there of a of, 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 of a national you know framework go go going on. I mean, yeah. I, Obviously, you worked with the Dublin Tier, the Rough Magic, and, and Project as well. But just that sense of those. Yeah, but I think, uh, like, you know, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Like, Ireland Theatre Company were an amazing theatre company, creating, like, producing some really spectacular work. It was, you know, like that Queer Hawks were doing stuff that was just so, you know, visceral and, and raw. And, you know, and, and the communities were all really supportive with, of of these theatre companies, I'm proud to have them, yeah. have them there, you know, and, but also, like, people in wherever, knew, like, let's say in Monaghan or here and now or whatever, knew of Island Theatre Company, and if they were doing a touring show that was coming here, you'd go see that show, because yeah. you'd know that you were getting quality. Yeah. You know? I think that's, I think, and, and through that time then, Colin, you're kind of really earning your chops also on TV and, you know, there was a lot of kind of, mm-hmm. you know, obviously a couple of stint on, uh, stint on Fair City and The Clinic obviously was, again, was a big, was a big TV show at the, at the, at the time. And yeah. you were there for a couple of seasons, wasn't it? Were there for it? Yeah, I was, I was in for like, I think it was maybe three seasons I was in, in for, um, you know, and uh, yeah, I, look, you know, I was really thankful for I, I think it's a tough one because people will ask, you know, what, what do you prefer? Now, Right now, I probably would be terrified to get up on stage because I haven't done it in yeah. years and years and years, you know. Um, but you can never, I, I don't, you can't really pick. I don't think you can pick uh, which is which you prefer because they're two different animals. They're two completely different beasts. Do you know what I mean? Um, and the immediacy that you get at the end of a play and that feeling like I talked about where you know that you have the audience in that moment, you know that they're sitting in the pocket. Uh, there's nothing like that. You can't get that from TV or film, you know, because you don't know what the audience reaction is, but you then are in that pocket. You know when you're sitting in that pocket when you're doing a scene on yeah. film and TV, you know. And some, But sometimes they're not the takes that get, get chosen <laughs> and you've got no control over them. There you go. You know? That wasn't my good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and come here, like, actually in relation to that, like, do you, at that time when you're on stage, um, like, was there were there nerves around it? Like, was it like you know, was what were you, uh, your 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 process before a show? Like, was it was there a big heave to step on the stage, or was it something that came completely kind of natural to you? I used to be terrified. I used to sit behind uh, 
I don't know if uh, I don't know if you were ever really back, backstage when just before. I'm sure sure you were, but I was in my own little thing. I used to have to stand behind the curtain and watch the audience come in or listen to them come in, and I'd just basically be shooting myself, <laughs> like and uh, just and I think that was more just to uh, just to know that there were people there. Yeah. Just to know that I, I was okay because that noise and stuff is not going to throw me when I'm in it because I know now that they're there you know what I mean yeah yeah um, and all through that time the band was kind of a big thing for you as well and um, the enemies I mean that was kind of you know yeah you were playing a lot weren't you yeah like uh, you know up, up, up until like certainly when I was doing Walking the Road it, what was great like the guys were always great for letting me go off and do a show and they'd say look when you finish it you can come back it's fine we'll just yeah we'll do it or whatever and um but yeah, no, up, I was like when I wasn't working uh, acting wise, I was gigging three, four nights a week. Right. You know? So, um, yeah, that was kind of, in a weird way, that was kind of the day job, you know what I mean? Bizarre that kind of was, The night job, that having two artistic jobs kind of balancing it. I know, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk a bit about kind of um, walking the road, because I think, you know, it said 2007, Ray A2, uh, now the City Arts Office, was the director here, and we commissioned with Flanders Field um, and the Ypres, the Ypres Museum um, and with County Meath as well to do a, uh, a Derek Bulger wanted to write a sort of story about the life of Francis Leverage and his kind of journey mm-hmm. to the First World War. A be- an extraordinarily beautiful piece of writing, but it said what was fascinating about it was it was a two-hander with about 40 odd characters and yourself and Kelly mm-hmm. Who is now actually uh, works in the arts office of Dublin City Council as well. Um, phenomenal actress from Bob ba- ba- Bally mm-hmm. Two of the that start. I mean, that was an extraordinarily beautiful show. But it went to strange places. I mean, you went to play in in um, Flanders Field. Yeah, that, yeah. That must have been amazing. Yeah, we went and did it in mean, Ypres, and you know, it's uh, if for people who don't know the show, which uh, you know, I'm sure most people probably won't have seen it, but. Um, Towards the end, there's a list of Irish men who were killed in the First World War, and in, in some of them were killed actually on the spot where we were performing the 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 show. And I just remember at one point I almost broke down doing that uh, list because it was a highly emotional. And it sounds when I say it's a list of people, you know, the way that it was done, the the piece itself was a highly emotional piece and you know it was really heightened and stuff like that and so at one point there I almost felt like I was going to go you know what I mean and uh, that was just an amazing uh, an amazing play to be to be a part of but also uh, you know so incredibly lucky to have Kelly as 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 sort of my dancing partner on it too you know what I mean because uh, she really was magnificent you know with the different characterizations, different characters that she play, and yeah, just a really powerful piece. I think even thinking about it now, I'm sort of getting a little bit choked yeah. up, you know. No, it is, and it's funny because um, it uh, the, the time I remember, and Marie Tierney's kind of set in Connors. Like there was there was a sense of there was a mood to the piece, and I think that you all, mm-hmm. that Ray and yourselves kind of really, really got the kind of sense of yeah, and very emotional because you know, as you say, those names, but also the fact of. Ledwidge being a normal, ma- a normal good young lad, and kind of off mm-hmm. the, the the terror of of, the, of that time, and the you know the yeah the, the the I think Dermot obviously being a poet himself really kind of latched into something kind of spe- special there. Yeah. And then the, the gas thing is you rock out after after open light and uh, play in the band. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, the band were playing at the at the open night. I did that actually at the at the premiere in, in Dublin of, of the right. Uh we did that the premiere was there and then I got up on the stage and played with the band for the for the night. So well everybody else got really drunk. Who's your man? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I recognise him from somewhere. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um but yeah, so and then excuse me, um and then as I said the clinic was there and you the spot in the in the tutors and you know, you had kind of T V and film and stage work. And then you're appearing in a film with Anthony Hopkins. Mm. How did that yeah. transpire from? Well, that sort of came about from the tutors. Uh, I did 
um, about eight, I was in an episode, one episode, and I did about eight minutes, ten minutes in that episode. Uh, I had a, a mini love story with um, Mary uh, and Princess Mary, who was played by Sarah Bulger, who went on to be in Once Upon a Time with me. Um, uh, and a casting director who's now since a very, very dear friend um, got in touch with me through Facebook, would you believe? But now nobody would answer messages on Facebook anymore. But, I, you know, I looked at, I looked at the company and stuff and knew that they were legit. And she she just said, look, thought thought you were great. Thought you had something. And if you have you got representation over here? And I didn't. And Helen and I were getting married uh, that July. And this was around about, I'd say, Mar- May. And she sort of said, look, I think you should go. And I'd, I'd spoken to my Irish agent, my Irish agent at the time, and they're like, well, maybe not. It's not maybe enough to go over with, whatever. But I just had a feeling that this was the opportunity. You know, like everybody, or most Irish actors are sitting there waiting to see the opportunity to go to the States and try and crack that or whatever. And, you know, you, you can't, I just had a feeling that, that, was, that this, if I didn't do it now, that was it. You know, and... I, I ended up going over, uh, you know, had a, went over then again in August after we came back from our honeymoon and uh, signed with an agency. And then six months later, I got, I got I got cast in the right, you know. And that was a real tough process. That was a, like, I had to really sort of keep working on that, working on that. And it was always looking like it was going to go to somebody else because they, you know, there were some high profile actors who wanted to do the role and, I think it had been offered to somebody and they were waiting to find out if he was going to do it. And then, but the director just really wanted me. He, he really liked what I was going to bring to it. And thank God it went that way. That's seismic in, in your life there. You just really spoken about, you know, yes, the opportunity, but just got married, you know, going over to America. Yes, there's interest from the casting agent. And then, you know, and maybe let's, let's talk about it for a second, but like that sense of, of, of the work, you know, of the, you know, this thing about, you know, getting spotted and suddenly you're on screen, and, you know, mm-hmm. that, that, that space, you, know, you mentioned you mentioned earlier on about the, the psychological and the emotional impacts of kind of refusals and, you know, and then refusals with no reasons, but now you're kind of having to keep pushing into something. That that takes, yeah. that, must, that must have taken some work for, from, your, from, from yourself. Yeah, keep going. yeah like, I mean, I, I, you know, I sort of, I taped for it here in Ireland and sent it over and, and that was before we had iPhones to do tapings and stuff like that. I mean, it was, it was a rigmarole. It took two days to get the tape over to them. But, um, you know, I had to go back and forth for different callbacks and different this, that and the other. And, um, and then when I got it and we were doing the press for it and stuff like that, then, you know, it was like, so what's it like being an overnight success? Yeah. All of a sudden, for your first movie, then landing this, and I was like, "Don't, don't, yeah. it's not. That's not the case." You know, I've been working, and I'd say that in the interviews, I say like, "No, no, 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 no." I've been working for ten, eleven years back home in Ireland, doing plays, and sometimes you're doing plays to less people in the audience than there are in the yeah in the cast. You know, so don't. <laughs> it's not an overnight success. And just in, in in relation to that process, though, just um, I'm always fascinated by like, at what stage do at what stage, like in that process, when we kind of were screen test started, like was it kind of when, when, when your tape went, went over, were you seen? That how, how does that normally work, or what works in that instance? Uh, I well, what happened was that I did the audition, and got sent over, and then I was just waiting to find to find out, and then um, there was a meeting set up. That they liked it. The director lived in London at the time, so I, I flew up to London to meet him, and there was a, I had a call back in LA, so I had to fly then, you know, I met with him in London, he sort of talked me through what he wanted me to do to get the part, uh, essentially. And then I had to go over and have a call back for the producers. Because you have to remember too, with with that movie, it was a Warner Brothers um, uh, film with New Line Cinema. So it wasn't just the director and the producers who had to say yes. It has to go all the way up the chain of command and, and then it goes into you know, sort of, they have these people who put a value on somebody's international worth yeah. to see if anyone will actually go see the movie and all that kind of stuff. And I obviously didn't have any sort of 
anything at all really so it was really a touch of God. but then Anthony Hopkins signed on to do it uh, so he wasn't really he hadn't signed on when I was in the process of doing all this uh, and once he'd signed on then they knew that they could sell, it. sell the movie with him so they could take a chance on me and um, I'd say the scale of that must have been something else kind of you know in relation to was that kind of an, an eye opener in relation to I mean, yeah, like it, you talk, I think the budget of 45 or million or something like that, and like it's complete, completely different than, yeah. you know, it's it's completely different than anything that I'd yeah. ever experienced. Even like the Tudors was a huge, yeah. huge production. Um, but even that, like, it, there's no comparison to. Yeah. And can I ask you about your first meeting with Mr. Hopkins? Like, what was that for you like? I mean, was it kind of, you know, I mean, you know, he's an acting god. <laughs> um, and was, like, was, like, was that kind of strange to kind of be meeting someone? I always think it's strange. I had to do, I had to do a uh, callback with him, uh, or a, chemi- a chemistry read, essentially, is what they call it. And so I'd fly from here over to LA to do that. And... What happened was I, I arrived first. Uh, it's very vivid. It was in a hotel you know, on the beach in Santa Monica. And I was there early. And I sort of went into the room where I was supposed to go. And nobody was there. And I was like, oh, God. And I was terrified. So I, I was like, right, I have to go to, the, go to the Jacks here to sort of get myself together. And then when I walked out, they were all walking in. And he came in. And he'd just been, he'd been filming Thor through the big beard, whatever. And... Uh, I was like, I'm giving myself 10 seconds just to freak out. Not in front, like not going to scream at him or anything, but I had to give myself 10 seconds to freak out. And then I said, right, after I in, and he came up to me and he just walked straight up and he said, hello, Colin, nice to meet you, I'm Tony. I said, let's just have fun. And I was like, okay, that was it. Yeah. 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 Let's just have fun. He said, no, let's just have fun. I'm gonna do it. And it was, it was great. Obviously he said, yeah, you know, because... At the end of the day, it was, I think essentially his call at that point. Yeah, yeah. So. But, I mean, well, it must have been an, an absolute, I mean, from, from an, a screen acting kind of, you know, lesson or being able to work across. And like I said, the, the joy of being able to act across him. And that, because it, it was very, you know, it was a, with the pair of you, you know, that was kind mm-hmm. of, that, that must be an absolute joy, joy for you. Oh, it was incredible. I mean, like that movie, I'm pretty much in, I don't think there's one scene that I'm not in. And, yeah. The majority of the movie is just the two of us, you know, and uh, just an absolute, like, just a, an incredible experience, yeah. you know, just a really incredible experience. Yeah. And then, like, was it, th- that's what well, then obviously that opens doors. That kind of, you're, you're, if you've done that movie, um, you've worked with Mr. Hopkins, you've kind of, you know, you're, I mean, it must be bizarre. I mean, from a home point, point of view, is, is it weird, you know, your, your family going to see you on, you know, as a main lead in a big, big Hollywood feature film? Mm. That, was, was that strange, kind of coming, coming back home then after it that? It was, yeah. I mean, I came, I came straight back home and yeah. started gigging with, the, gigging with the band again around the local pubs and stuff. So, you know, um, yeah, so it was, it was a strange one, all right. Uh, because, because then, you know, you finish shooting, but then... You know, I wasn't going straight into something, shooting something else. So then you're waiting for the sh- for the movie to get released and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was kind of a it, but, it was a kind of a funny one. At least you knew with the size of it, of, of your role that you weren't going to be cut out of it. I mean, you were kind of guaranteed that you were going to be there in the end. Of I it. mean, well, that was yeah, that was it. I, was, <laughs> I, I sort of knew that. So that was good. <laughs> and then how did um like from there? You know, what to what once upon a time like. Was that kind of was there a, a journey to to that or how did that happen? Uh, I did after I did the right. I did a uh, I did a pilot for ABC called Identity uh, with Angela Bassett, and it was a sort of a crime drama based on a, a, a show that ITV had done about identity theft. But I was playing the main sort of cop who detective who was living actually living undercover. Um, f- for years with a with a gang, but it turns out that he had married into the family, but he didn't tell the cops, and so he was in the uh, sort of catch twenty two. Anyway, the show didn't didn't go, even though it was really really good. It didn't get picked up, but it was with ABC, and 
Um, that was the year that Once Upon a Time actually was a pilot. So they were casting, they'd announced at Comic-Con um, the next year that they were bringing Captain Hook into Once Upon a Time. And uh, I was in LA at the time and I'd been sent to sides. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to ever get cast as Captain Hook. This is ridiculous. And they're like, no, we're no, the same that they want somebody younger. So I was like, right, well, this is what I'm going to do. Fully not expecting to get it. And uh, they loved it, Eddie and Adam. I went in the next day after they saw it. They called me and I went in and met them and then got offered the, the role. And, uh, you know, that's a big decision then because, you know, what, what people don't realize, when you sign on to do a big show like that or a network show, um, you have to sign on for five years, like a contract for five seasons or six seasons. Um, that's not to say that it'll go that long, but you have to sign on. But, so you have to be prepared that you're essentially relocating like for nine months of the year to, to wherever it is that you're filming, you know? Um, so yeah, it was big, but it, it ended up, I like, we didn't have once upon a time here. Um, it wasn't really on here until recently enough. So we didn't, I didn't realize how big a show it was. And, you know, at the time in the first season, I think they were getting something like 30 million viewers a week. Wow. You know, it was ma- like, it was a massive monster hit. Yeah. But that was back when you could get numbers like that. Yeah, you yeah. Know? No, but it, because, it, because it's gas, because you kind of go, again, because it hasn't been, I'd say, shown here until recently. But yeah, I mean, kind of when I, you know, the odd time online, when, when, when you tweet back, Jesus Christ, you kind of, you know, it's, it's the hit. And the, I suppose that, that's what's interesting to me about, the, about that word, is that there's a whole other kind of existence that kind of, I mean, particularly in the last... Mm that time frame since Once Upon a Time has come out, that's when the TV has exploded kind of as a new art form in, in, in a way. But did you, like, did you have a sense, like, but when did you start get, getting a sense of that from, from when it was shoot, shooting column? Was there a time you went, okay, this is now getting big? Well, the first, my first weekend, when I first started shooting, I was on like a proper, I was on the Jolly Roger and it was like a proper boat, the Lady Washington, and we were sailing out around Wow. the islands in Vancouver and there was a there was a boat with a camera attached to it a massive crane and Robert Carlyle was standing opposite me and I was like okay right this is this yeah. is uh, serious now you know you better you better concentrate Colin you know? yeah, yeah. Better, better take this one seriously <laughs> yeah um, and it, but it must I mean I think something like that I mean because you know it's something of, of, of that scale but yeah at, the, at, its, at its heart a very kind of storytelling you know that Obviously, once upon a time, it's very storytelling. But I think there's mm-hmm. there's there's quality people all, all all over that work. Oh yeah, 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 all over. I mean, it was it's it's a tough, you know, it's it's an absolute joy to do, but it's a tougher gig than people think it is. You know what I mean? You know, because you have to make talking about magical coconuts or purple pixie dust or whatever. You have to make it seem like it, it's actually real you know and that's one thing that i think once upon a time did really well was convincing people that these characters actually existed in the real world and they were real you know what i mean and it's kind of it really captured something eddie and adam who created the show i spoke in the bed and they were like look we wanted to do something that was just purely about hope we wanted to go the opposite as to what everybody else was doing everything had to be gritty and had to be like, you know, dark or whatever. We were like, well, you know, I mean, Once Upon a Time can be quite gritty for that type of world, but, you know, they they were, they just wanted to do a show about hope. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it worked. And go, go back there just a because it's interesting, you know, about was at the level of kind of special, special effects as part part of it. I mean, was that, I mean, obviously from the, from the kid that was, that was interested in the whole model making mm. it, that must have been kind of lit up a whole other part of your brain to be seen. Yeah, yeah, it was wild because I hadn't, like, on the right, we had a, some special effects, but not anything really, you know, not creating a whole world. But once upon a time, we had this huge green screen studio that literally an entire, and you, what was crazy, and I know that it's even far more advanced now because, like, even the last thing I did, but you could see on the screens in live action, the actual movement of the town and somebody walked through, you know what I mean? Um, and it was just sort of, yeah, it's, it's wild. It was crazy. 
Well, that's phenomenal. I didn't realize you could actually see. You could actually see. You could refer yourself. Yeah, on the screens. So when we're on on the stage, it was all green, and everything was green. And sometimes you you're like, no, no, no. You're walking through a wall. If you want, you're walking through. No, you. Because they'd have it marked out. It was crazy. Like all the markings were all done in the same color green as the actual paint. Right. <laughs> so I had to. Um, but when you were standing behind the screen watching the screen live, you could see the yeah, you could see the world. And um, brilliant storylines. I mean, I think as I say, it must be yeah. great fun to do. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. It was great. Yeah, it was absolutely like it was an amazing experience, you know. Um, and what was great about it was that every every week every episode we were in a completely different world one week we were in neverland the next week we were in wherever and you know i got to play a sort of swashbuckling pirate who with black leather and black eyeliner like what's not to not rock to like star. bring bring that to you in a, in a, in a rock, rock star. Actually, I was a, yeah i was yeah. a rock star i used to sometimes walk out on set and i'd have the speaker going and i'd be playing in excess and need you tonight as i walked in in my leather pants <laughs> Every young man's dream, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And in in relation, to the, in relation to that work, I mean, were, were you aware of kind of the fame around it? Like, were you were you were, were you kind of going to the comic cons? Was that part of the kind of the 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 arrangement? Yeah, it wasn't until my first comic con that I sort of went, "Oh my god, this is insane." Um. Because we would we play like in the big hall, we do all that kind of stuff, and there'd be like people queuing for a day to get in, and like I mean thousands of people outside. Just yeah, it was it, it sort of it was a bit of a it was kind of a phenomenon, you know. That must be some that must be some you know I've, I've no grounding in how that would might feel, but like that, that that must be some buzz in relation to to yeah to, to be playing this character that is kind of um, loved that much and kind of. An interest in the minutiae. I mean, I, I'm always fascinated by by people kind of who star in, in roles like that, and then when they're asked, that their their fans sometimes know more about more about what they do than they do themselves. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. But you seem to have a, a very 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 good relationship with them. With yeah. Them. Uh, look, the other side of it is, is, to be honest, we were shooting up in Vancouver, and like we were doing sixteen hour days, uh, four or five days a week, and and so that's the actual real world is doing that not you know like sometimes people think that that thing of comic-con everywhere you go you know maybe it is for michael jordan or for whoever but at the end of the day you know i was just doing my job and that was the real world uh, not going around and having people screaming at you whatever it was only when there was an event on where they knew that you'd be there and it was you sort of have people but I don't know, it's kind of, you know, I was just glad to have a job and, and a good job and one that I liked, liked doing, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I won't keep you much, much longer, but um, obviously you're kind of about to appear in some, something else. Did that come from, from that? Did the, did the right stuff kind of emerge from? Well, I mean, I, I'd done uh, another thing, a Dolly Parton sort of one-off episode thing of the a Western, which was fun, which came came off the back of that was not long after I dropped, and you know I got to hang out with Dolly Parton and stuff. It was, it was incredible, you know. And uh, the right stuff, sort of, it kind of, yeah, in a weird way, it, it came around. Um, the company make it happy in way. I had had a meeting a couple of years ago with, uh, and they gave me the book with a whole lot of other books of things that they were going to be working on and producing. Uh, and they hadn't even had a script or a spec script for the right stuff, but they gave me that. And I remember always going, that's something that I like to be a part of. And, um, and, and you know, this is common knowledge. Somebody else had been cast in the role and, and uh, for, um, for some reasons he couldn't, he couldn't do it. So they, I had two days to, or a day and a half to decide to fly over to Orlando and oh. do it for five months. So, Jeez, they yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, 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 the shots look great. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It, it looks it looks fantastic. The, 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 the shots from it. It's kind of lo looking forward to seeing it. Um, but com come here. Can I ask you, like, is there that same buzz with you from when you were 
back, you know, from when you were that young lad convinced to go to the youth theatre by, mm. by your mate. You know, yeah. that's the same excitement now as you, you know, I mean, you're still only a young, a young man. So, like, when you, when you kind of approach those roles, no matter what scale there is, is there still that kind of sense of... It's yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I love it. It's, 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 it's me. It's what I... It's what it's what I am, uh, you know. I'm, I'm an actor, so that's you know. I, 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 I sometimes liken it to it's going to be weird, but almost like being like a vampire. You know, I just when you finish, you sort of Jones and get the next job. You know what I mean? It's I can't I, I can't do I can't do anything else. I mean I can, but I can't get my head around. It's funny because I find it I find it difficult at times to focus. Like I find it difficult to sit down and say, "Well, I'm going to play the guitar for an hour. I'm going to practice for an hour, or I'm going to go paint for two hours." I can't find that hard to focus. But acting is the only sort of thing that sort of okay to focus in. On. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and so on, on. I mean, do you still do you still play guitar? That's something that you see still do. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I still play. I still play guitar. I I sort of collect them more than play them really. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. and do you um, paint? Is that something? That you I, I used to. I, I kind of. I'll pick it up every so often, and I'll, yeah. I'll try and dabble. It's something that I want. I want to do more of. To be honest, when I get back into doing it. So. Yeah, and it's weird actually because you were saying there earlier on about when you did the writing, then you before it was even out, you came back and were kind of gigging and pubbing, whatever you know. And I think that's one of the, one of the real differences, say, between theatre and film is that you know. Your work in the film is done, but no one's seen it. So there's mm-hmm. a weird space that that you're in, that, and that, yeah. I, that, that must take a lot of getting used to as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, uh, it's crazy. TV is different though, because well, certainly once upon a time it was different because you know we'd start and we'd film for about three or four months, and then the show would air. But then we would be shooting an episode over eight days, eight nine days, but every week an episode. So slowly it begins to creep back up to so it's airing while you're shooting then you know what i mean yeah. uh, with the right with the right stuff now we finished in december so and it'll be out sometime in the autumn so there's a bit of a gap there but as it turns out nobody's working at the minute anyway oh, yeah. like very few people one of the few people who kind of perfect time you can kind of use it yeah, i know yeah yeah, yeah. Listen, Colin, thanks very, very much for taking time time out um, to have a chat to me and um, I'll hopefully see you soon when we're all released from our... From yeah. Our- yeah, absolutely. Thanks, all man. right, Mark. Thanks, for, thanks a million. Bye.